Okay, so today we are here with Brian Bursick, the CEO of Wonder Capital, and we are gonna talk to you guys a little bit about solar, how it is affecting certain companies like Tesla, and what kind of the future is. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, so, a couple things we wanted to cover with you guys today. Um, go over exactly this new solar tariff that's hit. Uh, I know a lot of people are questioning it and thinking that it's gonna make solar crazy expensive. So what is the take on that? Yeah, so um, as you say, a lot of the headline numbers that people are seeing are this 30% tariff. Mm -hmm. But when you really break down how that's gonna impact the solar industry, the impact is quite a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to recognize is that the tariff itself is only gonna hit about 60% of the panels used in the United States. A big part of that is actually an exemption for the first two and a half gigawatts of panels. Okay. Uh, some of that is that a lot of these panels come from countries that are protected under a NAFTA, um, you know, Canadian solar, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a small domestic industry. So only 60% of the panels are gonna see this 30% increase. So on the market level, that's an 18% increase. And then the next reduction is that panels are only about a third of systems these days, mm -hmm. um, rooftop systems. And so actually at the on the ground level, this 30% number goes all the way down to 6%, okay. a third of 18%. And so what Goldman Sachs thinks, what our industry group thinks is that it's gonna be maybe a mid single digit increase in pricing because of the tariff. But I think what's really important to note, and we wrote a blog post about this uh, that we titled 2017 All Over Again, mm -hmm. which makes the point that in the last year, we've seen the price of solar go down by 10%. And so the price of solar going up by you know mid-single digits mm -hmm. is really just the market going back to what it looked like in the middle of last year. Okay. And so everybody understands in the industry what made sense and what didn't six months ago. The industry was doing great. It was really healthy. And I don't think we're worried at all about rolling the clock back six months. So that's when you really look at it and you get down to the numbers. Um, the impact on the ground is basically about six months of market growth mm -hmm. gets frozen, uh, admittedly. Mm -hmm. But uh, the idea that that's somehow going to destroy the solar industry just doesn't comport with the numbers on the ground. I guess in the future then, as the price drops, the solar tariff will presumably stay the same, so effectively it will continue to drop back again. It will definitely continue to drop as the forces both on the hardware side and things like installation and soft costs go down. Mm -hmm. And actually the tariff itself steps down over the next four years. Okay. So the tariff itself will be going down. Uh, to your point, the 40 year cost story that we know about in solar will continue. And um, I think we'll see within a couple of years that this was quite a bit of a do about uh, not quite nothing, but not quite as much as it's been made. Yeah, because I know I've seen a lot of news stories lately, everyone blowing this up saying solar is basically going to become unattainable for most. So that's just simply not the case. Though. Simply not the case. If that were the case six months ago, we wouldn't have had a solar industry because that's really the pricing we're returning to. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's awesome to hear. I know. It's good news. Yeah, definitely great news <laughs> for everybody, especially those of you that are interested in solar. Okay, so another big topic is how will the EV industry really affect our energy consumption, especially here in the US. That is a huge hot topic is how will we keep up with that? I know being in the industry you're in, you kind of have the foresight for that. So what does that kind of look like too? Yeah, so if you look at at a national level how we consume power, the transportation market, which to date has obviously been predominantly oil, is about the same size as the entire electricity market. So when we're talking about electric vehicles pulling uh, transportation energy over onto the grid, we're really talking about at full penetration, a doubling of how much electricity we need in this country yeah. uh, to power what we're doing every day. So what's I think really exciting about that is that obviously more and more of what we're building that's new is renewables. Mm -hmm. But one of our challenges is that we have a grid that's been built over 40 or 50 years. And once you build something like a coal factory that might last 40 or 50 years, it's not generally very um, cost effective or economically viable to just shut it down in the middle of its life. Right. And so I think what's also exciting kind of tying EVs and solar together is that right when we will have this huge demand for electricity coming from transportation, a place where it's never um, put a real demand on the grid, mm -hmm. we'll have these renewables ready to grow yeah. into that new capacity. So that's a great point because I know a lot of people that actually work at those plants are a little concerned too. So 
they'll just probably run them until the end of their lifespan and then just switch everything over? Is that? I think that's exactly right. Okay. Um, we're at a point where, um, and you're seeing this more and more at the utility scale in particular, mm -hmm. but renewables are cost competitive with hydrocarbons built from scratch, from we need more capacity, what should we add? Right. The next level, and we're, we've just gotten there and there are places where it's not quite yet true, but mm -hmm. I think we're clearly going to get to the point where that's the case. The next big economic level is on an ongoing variable cost basis. Mm -hmm. Is it cheaper to keep operating the coal facility or build brand new solar? Right. We're definitely still at the point where it's more economically viable to keep operating the existing facility, mm -hmm. but there are people that think in the next 10 years we'll actually get to the point where it's more effective to build new solar or wind mm -hmm. than to keep operating existing um, assets. And I think that is the big question for the utilities as they own all of these assets and the independent power producers. Will they keep operating through their lifetime or we actually get to a point where they stop operating? The second point there that might be interesting to folks is often called uh, V to G or vehicle to grid, which is not something that's operating in a lot of places today, but basically would allow you to take the battery that you're driving around in your vehicle and when you were stationary, tap into the grid such that you could add that battery capacity and do things like draw down excess power in the middle of the day from solar panels and then release them when you might have a demand charge or it might be the middle of the night. So that would effectively almost make your car like a power wall. That's exactly right. Okay, yeah, I know. Uh, I've been hoping Tesla would introduce that. It would be great to have. Being able to draw power from your Tesla to run your house would be amazing. And I think that's why, you know, there's a really good argument that, you know, Tesla, the car, um, the solar that they can put in your home and the power wall work so seamlessly together right uh, because you know you can use that power wall to charge down excess mm -hmm. release into your battery connect your car into that battery process such mm -hmm. that you can double your capacity yeah um, and uh, you know I think that that's why although I think there were some doubters when Tesla bought solar city there really is a way in which these things all allow one home or one business to um, really totally change the way they interact with the, the electricity, the energy market. Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. Okay, so on that point, like how are utilities going to uh, handle an increase and how do they feel about the whole EV market? What's really interesting is that utilities, who I think people sometimes think of as conservative and somewhat backwards in this space, in places like California and New York have been incredibly supportive of uh, electric vehicle rebates for precisely this point, because they realize that there's an opportunity for the electricity grid, which is a lot cleaner and getting more so as we've been talking about, to support really you know a market just as big as their historical market, electricity, which is transportation. So talking about all this solar, how exactly does Wonder Capital tie into all this? Yeah, so when we started the company in 2013, what we found was that homeowners were putting up solar in record numbers. Uh, utilities were adding more and more solar to the grid because of these falling costs we've been talking about. And the commercial market, the businesses, the hospitals, the universities, just weren't going solar at nearly the same rate. Mm -hmm. And the more we dove in, the more we realized that these are 25 year assets. People really want to finance these things. Most solar purchases are financed. Yeah. And homeowners had these great FICO enabled financing packages. Utilities are these huge companies, easy for them to get financing. And a lot of the businesses around this country, a lot of the schools, hospitals, municipalities, just weren't finding easy financing packages. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we launched a couple of different funds that pay investor a steady and projected return. We've got a seven and a half percent fund is our most popular um, on the site today. And we take that capital and we go out and lend it to these businesses and municipalities and hospitals. Uh, we only approve about 10% of the people that apply, so we're pretty picky. But we pull up those projects, those loans into a fund, and that's what pays your returns. So that's what we do in the market. We connect uh, borrowers in 30 states, again, you know, businesses, schools, municipalities, with investors all around the country, individuals on our website, wondercapital.com, and also big institutions with you know, multi-million dollar facilities. So if somebody watching was interested, how would they go about supporting Wonder? Yeah, so if you're interested in um, you know, making that projected 7.5%, go on to wondercapital.com, check out the funds, uh, see if it's a good fit for you. If you're a business, municipality, school, uh, again, come to wondercapital.com and we've got a great Go Solar site that'll g grab you a cost estimate and we'll pair you up with one of our 100 plus approved installers in 30 states. We'll go ahead and have a link down in the description below. Definitely check it out. 
Um, it sounds like a great opportunity and just helps advance solar that much more. And that's definitely something in this kind of environment that we need. We need more solar, we need more EVs, just help clean up the environment a lot more. So 2017 for Wonder Capital looked to be a great year. What exactly was Wonder able to build that year? Yeah, so last year we were uh, lucky enough to actually uh, 10x the amount of solar that we financed. So we went from in 2016 financing a little more than three megawatts to last year financing 37 megawatts. Um, or to give folks a sense, uh, that's about, depending on pricing, uh, about 75 to 100 million dollars of solar financing around the country. Most of that, frankly, has to do with the fact that the solar market is just getting more and more cost effective in more and more places, and our partners are all growing. And because of that, we were able to bring more and more capital to the space. Um, to give just some examples of the types of um, uh, projects that we were able to finance in this last year, uh, we did a, a you know really um, kind of long-standing and profitable beach resort in Hawaii. Uh, we actually did in California the Department of Water and Power, mm -hmm. so a municipality, obviously long-standing, not going anywhere. Yep. Um, we did uh, a big uh, new build for a nonprofit theater, big prominent theater in Boston. Um, we did some schools in the D.C. area uh, as well as Ohio. Um, we did some things like credit unions in Virginia, long-standing credit unions, a series of those. So really all over the country, all different types of businesses and borrowers okay. uh, we were able to help in 2017 and we're hoping to grow not quite that much but uh, three to four X this year to do even more nice yeah I mean 37 megawatts is nothing to laugh at that is I mean if you would put that together how many football fields of solar do you think that is that is a rough estimate rough estimate I'd say a two megawatts might be a football field so let's say oh, that's wow. Yeah, so that so might that's be like 16, 18 eight, fields. Yep, exactly. Wow. So 16, 17 football fields. That, in the grand scheme of it, is, is pretty massive. Energy produced off of that. Do you know roughly what that was in 2017? Yeah, so um, we do a lot of equivalents that are uh, pretty fun. They're actually in our 2017 year in review. Um, you know, my favorite are around the home. So I think it was the enough production of solar to power more than 50,000 homes uh, throughout the year or to take more than 300,000 cars off the road. Wow, yeah, that's that's a significant amount. <laughs> it is. I know a lot of people have questions and really wanna know what the future holds for solar. And as someone active in the industry, what do you guys see the next five, 10, 20 plus years with solar? We think the next 10 years are gonna be a lot more exciting and see a lot more change than I think the continuation of the status quo expectation is. Mm -hmm. And what that's driven by is a real fundamental change in the way that we think about our electricity network. If you think about it as a, a network like any other, right now it's a very fragile, centralized, unidirectional network. Mm -hmm. And this is why we see crazy things like rolling blackouts, uh, which reflect the fact that you can have a single choke point fail and thousands of people see an impact, which is something that, for example, on the internet we would absolutely never accept. Right. And we certainly don't see. And what's so exciting about both solar and storage, uh, as it gets cheaper and cheaper, is that it moves us from a centralized generation that gets spread out in a unidirectional way and is very fragile, mm -hmm. to a real network that's bi-directional and you're creating power with solar on the edge of the grid at homes and at businesses. Um, you're providing storage capacity. And the grid really goes for something that just goes uh, from these big centralized sources to you to something that you participate in and you generate a lot of your value on site. Yeah. And um, you know that's really exciting if you're selling solar or selling storage or in those industries, but we also think it's really exciting in terms of the resiliency and the dynamism of the electric grid. That's my biggest thing is I would love to be able to plug my car into my house. Absolutely. And to be able to have that fluid of a network is I think key for the future of solar. So Tesla, if you're listening, we would really like that. That's right, please do that. <laughs> you know, the other piece there that I think is exciting and facilitates this, and there's obviously a lot of conversation about today is the blockchain. Yeah. And when you think about a distributed ledger, which is really what the blockchain technology allows, mm -hmm. it's exactly the kind of thing you'd want if 
throughout the day at thousands and millions of different locations, people need to get credit for every incremental excess KWH they generate and send to the grid or the extra storage capacity they provide. You can imagine that kind of distributed ledger keeping track of what you've done. Yeah. And at the end of the month, utility basically tallies up what you've contributed and what you've consumed and gives you some net payout. So this new technology blockchain that we're hearing so much about actually can could have a fundamental role to play in the energy transformation we see over the next decade or so. So the other thing when you think about the future of energy that we hear something about, and Bill Gates has been talking a lot about this recently, he raised a big fund, are energy technologies and concepts that are not yet proven. So things beyond the solar and the wind that is scaling today. And I think the thing to understand about the energy market as compared to other markets that we you know, experience on a day-to-day -day basis, the way that phones get adopted or the way that flat screen TVs evolve is that this is a very, very, very large industry that is very conservative in their adoption of new ways to generate power mm -hmm. for really good reasons. You know, we can see in places like Puerto Rico what happens when people don't have power. Yep. And so power generation tends to be one of those things that we don't adopt the newfangled stuff until it's really well proven. Yeah. And so when you look at the adoption of new types of energy technology, it takes often decades to go from something in the lab to one scale manufacturing facility to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to the 10,000 or 20,000 you need to actually start making a dent mm -hmm. into this huge industry. And so I think the other thing for folks thinking about solar, thinking about Tesla's business there and others is I don't think you have anything to worry about with you know kids at MIT figuring out fusion mm -hmm. or small scale nuclear um, or you know interesting new geothermal use cases. Um, the only thing we're going to see over the next decade or two is wind and solar because it takes that long for a new technology to make any um, any real progress in this enormous market. You know, solar has been coming down about 10% per year in cost since mm -hmm. 1978. And it wasn't until the last five years or so that it got really cost competitive in a lot of places. Yeah. So that's 35, 40 years of cost reductions exactly. that solar had to go through until it got down to the price points of hydrocarbons. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time to kind of go over some of that and clarify a lot of that. I know a lot of that has a lot of misconceptions behind it. And so now we kind of know exactly how it is, which is great. Um, now, if somebody would like to get a hold of you or potentially invest, how can they go about doing that? Yeah, so anyone interested in investing or borrowing for solar can come to wondercapital.com. We've got live chat on the site. You can book time with one of our awesome team members or me personally, um, I'm Brian at wondercapital.com. Give me a shout or I'm active on Twitter at Bursic. Uh, so any one of those places, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so definitely go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and put the link for their website down in the description below. Definitely go ahead and show them some love. As always, though, thumbs up if you enjoyed. Go ahead and click here to subscribe, here for some other videos, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.